Okay, welcome to CS 235 Applied Robot Design for Non-Robot Designers, Lecture 10. Today we're going to be uh, finishing up a few notes on uh, encoders, talking more about motors and then how to interface your robots to your computer. Uh, a few administrivia. I got confirmation from the laser cutter guys. They're cutting them as we speak. I'm picking them up tomorrow morning, so we'll have office hours starting tomorrow night for uh, doing lab two. Uh, tentatively, if Rob or I don't both drop dead simultaneously from exhaustion, we will be having office hours Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for some large chunk of time so you can all finish up lab two. I'll send out lab three uh, hopefully on Monday. Um, that may be the last lab because then you have a final project. Now, um, I'm not going to screw any of you over in terms of not giving you a final project, but I, I'm just curious. The two options in terms of course structure are we could just give you a bunch more labs, or we could give you, we could cut off two labs and give you a final project. So let's see, see a show of hands for who would prefer all labs, no project. Could you, yeah, could you describe what the difference would be? Uh, the difference is, so the final project will be some type of robot arm something unless you have a very well-constrained, well-reasoned, and pre-approved research project that you're doing. Uh, it's not one of these things where it's like, oh man, I don't want to do a robot arm, so I'm going to come up with a research project. It's, I've talked with your advisor and you to make sure this is good. Um, so probably be three to four degree of freedom robot arm, just pick up things on a desk, like chess pieces. Uh, and you'll probably have about three weeks to do it, and I think we're going to have teams of three. Um, as opposed to that, we could do just more labs of the same type of thing where I've designed something I think is particularly useful, and you guys make it SOLIDWORKS and build it in real life. And so the difference is uh, the project, you get to do roughly what you want within some boundaries. The labs, you do what I want, but you're sort of guaranteed to learn the lessons that I pre-planned for you. Um, now this was this was sold as a project class and as such I'm more than happy to give you guys a final project but I'm just curious what percentage of you would prefer the remainder to be just labs and what percentage would prefer to have a final project in lieu of additional labs. So show of hands, all, yep. <laughs> Let me ask you, will the final project involve building something? Yeah. <laughs> if you're building something, should you be using SOLIDWORKS? You will be, you will be using SOLIDWORKS very much for the final project. So, are we going to get another lab and then final project? Yes. I, I wanted you guys to have five labs, and the laser cutter stuff happened, and so that's not happening. It's probably in your best interest you didn't have five labs, because it might have killed some of you mm -hmm. and me. So at the very minimum, I will not let you out of this class until you've done a cable transmission for lab three. But there are other things I wanted to do, like uh, basically linear systems instead of rotary, it's linear. I wanted to do parallelograms and ro remote center of motions and maybe a bike cable type thing. And they're all wonderful topics, but they're not a final project. So you, you at the very minimum, you have to do a cable transmission for lab three, because then we will have done gears, belts, friction drive and cables, which are the, the big ones. So show of hands, who would like the remainder just labs? Not many of you. Okay. All right, so we'll have a final project. Um, so so with the labs, I guess I guess I'm kinda of lost on how you design them. I guess I guess you know that looks I think that's you know we could do a final project where where you teach us That's what the final project is. It's you designing a lab. Or, or you do a lab where you kind of help us design. Nah, no time. That's kind of hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the difference is the final project, you get three weeks because you're not just catting it in. It's just like right now, you look at the soybean file and you're like, how the heck did you come up with all these? But things? my hope is that that opinion is not shared uniformly. My hope is that there's some distribution of people who are like, oh yeah, that makes total sense, and some people are like, I have no clue where this came from. Give me another lab, and hopefully you'll understand where the designs came from. Yeah. Is it possible with the final project to be structured in a way that we use some of the components? Of course. Class, but An excellent uh, robot wrist would be a friction differential. Uh, an excellent you know, base for a robot arm would be a cable transmission. So uh, an excellent transmission for a little gripper, parallelogram gripper, to reverse the motion would be a gear. So um, 
the exact same elements from the labs can, can and should be used for the final project. Well, I meant the, the labs that we're not going to do. Oh, yeah, sure, we could do that. And I would love to do that. So, so oh, then, excellent idea. Like those sure, yeah, I can do that. Okay, maybe. We'll, uh, well, I hadn't completely planned them, but uh, one of them was going to be linear motion, and another was going to be like a remote center of motion. Remote center of motion, or just a special type of parallelogram. All right, so maybe I'll roll the last two labs into part of the requirements for the fun. You're smart. I mean, I just want to be able to like work with those systems, right? And not have to like rely on. Sure. <laughs> All right, well. I thank you very much for that idea. That's what we'll do. So I'll roll the concepts, some of the concepts from labs four and five into the final project. So the philosophy is it's not an open-ended project because even though I'm sure that some of you one day will far surpass me as a designer, my hope is that you have not yet done that because then I should not be standing here. So I don't expect you all to be creative yet in terms of like you're just going to whip up something real fast in the kitchen for a cable transmission, right? My goal in these labs has been to tell you this is how you do a cable transmission. Copy it number for number and it will work and you assemble and you see it works. Then and only then are you like, okay, hey, I understand how this works. And then next time you start tweaking it and you keep tweaking a little further and pretty soon you have such a thorough understanding and intuitive feel of how it works that you can start creating your own things, right? You know those exams where they take the homework and multiply it times 10 because they want to see you like extend it. I hate those exams because I, if you barely know the material to begin with, extending it is not feasible. At least it was never for me. So um, the final project is meant for you to add a very small plus epsilon. It's to give you a second chance to practice these things and hopefully to a little less hand-holding from me, but still holding your hand. This is not going to be like, all right, guys, I'm going to the Bahamas. I'll see you in three weeks. Show me your robots. <laughs> so as such, uh, we're doing groups of three. Uh, so you all need to break into groups of three. Uh, let's try to do that, um, I don't know, by Wednesday next week, so a week from today. And at least one of you has to be an excellent C++ coder. There will be zero exceptions to this. Or if you can convince me your robot's going to be in Java, I will then convince you it's not. And I still want an excellent C++ coder. <laughs> so um, I need to know. I'll send out an email about the details about how I want to know about your groups. But um, if you want to do research, you need to let me know now. Some of you already have, and that's fine. And I need to know who's in your group, what you're going to be working on, if it's not my robot arm type thingy, and who your C++ elite hacksaw is. OK. So last week, or uh, wow, <laughs> two days ago, which seemed like last week, we discussed uh, many things, including optical encoders. And I thought, well, I drew it on the board, but it wasn't that good of a sketch. So I'm going to start out today by showing you. Anyone know what this dinosaur is here in front of me? It's an oscilloscope. Has anyone here not seen an oscilloscope? I knew there would be someone. That's good. Thank you. OK. Let me stabilize. So what I have going on is this is channel A, this is channel B. Remember this is what type of an optical encoder? Quadrature. We have two signals so we can get a times four resolution bump and we're also uh, sensing direction. Um, and let me zoom in for a sec. So this is what it looks like when your motor's spinning fast. This is what it looks like when it's barely moving. Anyone tell me what this vibration is from? Why are the lines wiggling back and forth? The motor is not at a precise velocity. It's just sort of out of velocity. So uh, they're changing in, uh, the size because it's not precise. It's, uh, now let's see. Let me zoom in. Yeah, the motor is spinning at a constant velocity. Well, as constant as it can without me closing a loop on it. This is open loop right now. Someone tell me something about the phase offset between A and B. 90 degrees. So I was not making it up. This is a real live, in the wild optical encoder. We got A and B, 90 degrees offset. Now let me... It's not quite 90 degrees, right? The left one is closer to the right one than the bottom one. 
Um, there are many things that could lead to that. It's roughly 90 degrees. So this is mechanically difficult. I'm going to set the camera here. Okay, does that make anyone nauseated yet? Uh, I'm good. Okay, I'm going to make the motor faster. And you can, anyone hear that whirring? It's my mechanical arm. Motor slower. Motor faster. So the ticks get closer together. So anyway, I wanted you all to see what a quadrature encoder looks like on the O-scope. Now, why, other than that being interesting to uh, show us that the signal actually does exist, why is that a useful exercise? Anyone? What happens when your encoder stops working? What do you, how are you going to debug it? You're going to break out your oscope. Encoders are one of those annoying things that cannot be looked at or sniffed at or tasted to figure out what's wrong with them. You have to actually break out the oscope. Okay, so there, um, yes? this final project, how much electronics are we going to have to do? Very minimal. Soldering a few wires, that's it. I'm giving you a plug and play fidgets. That's what I was just driving. Plug in USB, Linux, Mac, and Windows supported. I'm also giving you starter code for a GUI. Has anyone made a robot run with a GUI before? Okay, two people. You should get friendly with GUIs, they're very useful. Um, so, last time we talked about quadrature optical encoders and what were the voltage values I was dealing with. Anybody? Zero. So roughly zero to five. Okay, so there's something called single ended and differential signals. Single ended means that, uh, and, and let's rewrite this as high and low. Really, who gives a crap? Maybe this is three and maybe that's eight. Does it really matter? I mean, other than our drive electronics, we simply want a Boolean digital value. So let's think of this as low and high. Single-ended means it is ground referenced. So our high is referenced to ground. Differential means we actually take high and subtract low and that gives us the value. Subtract high from low. Anyone know why we might want to subtract things instead of just reference it to ground? Do you have like an AC offset or something? Uh, yes. Now, let me be careful for a second. Whoever gets this right has to wear my hat. So, this may change your motivation for being correct. Let's try again. Let's go until we can get someone correct. Why would I want a differential signal? So, I mean, it's not, like, to avoid RF interference. Get the no. hat. You get the hat. <laughs> Noise. <laughs> okay, that's long enough. That's good. Um, differential. So basically, if you have two wires together and you have RF noise or radio frequency, high frequency noise, as perhaps a giant DC motor would output commonly, if it gets on both lines, but you're subtracting the lines, then you're subtracting off the same thing you just added, right? So um, in single-ended, I hook the ground of my encoder up to the ground of whatever board's reading it. Ground is not going to change. <clears throat> but if I add noise to it, that noise really screws me over. But here, I'm not hooking to ground anyway. I have H minus L, okay? So now, if I have H plus some epsilon noise minus L plus some epsilon noise, those cancel out and I still get H minus L. Now why do I have epsilon on both sides? I have two wires. This is also the reason why you twist wires together often, is you're hoping by twisting them together, you're ensuring the wires are not going to separate. So if I take my encoded wires and I put them over here, which I could do, then I might have a motor here but not here, so I only have noise on one line. 
that would still kill a differential signal because then the noise wouldn't be on both lines. Uh huh. Um, but if you have two like clocking pulses really close to each other, don't they interfere or generate like? I haven't had any issues from. I haven't had any issues. The, uh, the reference for this is Ed Carrier, who is a guru of all things mechatronic, and he goes into much greater detail than I will. The level of detail I'm saying is <clears throat> you're trying to get the wires to get the same noise. You want that. You're twisting them together so that local noise sources are actually going to interject identical noise on both lines. You subtract off your epsilons, <clears throat> and you're left with H minus L, and so you still have the same signal. Okay. Let's talk about a, a night. Is everyone clear on this? Single ended is reference to what? Ground. Ground. Okay. So uh, there's another type of encoder. <clears throat> this is a nasty shape. Let's try something different. This doesn't give us much information, right? We have uh, a one and a zero and nothing in between. Any other ways we might do this? Similar looking curves with more information? Do a sine. Who said that? Okay, sine waves. Yes. So we could. I'm not good at drawing sine waves, but were I, I could do this. Isn't that more noisy? No. Well, yes. Okay, in a different way than you were thinking. Do you want to find the way? Nope. So the way we're doing this is uh, it's called a sine wave encoder or just a sine encoder. These are supposed to be really high end super high precision compared to the same number of ticks. The reason being, uh, consider each one of these little tick marks here. We have the same number of counts in terms of clock cycles of the sine wave, but in here I can look up and pick off a unique analog voltage right here. And so again we don't want just one sine wave because we couldn't tell direction. We want two offset by 90 degrees. So now <coughs> We've got two sine waves, and basically within a given count, you look up and see where along the sine you are for that given clock cycle, and that gives you resolution and precision within that clock cycle. Now what's, yeah? Uh, wouldn't that just totally go to crap if you uh, had any noise at all in your sine wave? Yes. That was the noise issue. So the issue is this is analog. And so you have to be really careful about the noise issues here. What's another issue in terms of, uh, well, let me get back to this for a second. We need to discuss one last issue, and then once we've discussed that issue, we can come back here. Um, okay, just real quick, we're going to come back to this issue of noise for a sec. But um, remember how, what are the two main types of joints we have? Like types of motion? Revolute and linear. So I've shown you the US digital encoders for rotary. They exist for linear as well. So basically you take that code wheel and you lay it out on a strip. And so um, this would be a long strip here and then you just have tick marks. And then you just put uh, in this, uh, most of the time instead of being transmissive where you put, you put a little Late, you know, light laser or LED there and a, an eyeball here, it's reflective. So you put them here and it bounces off like that. And the, the, the slits won't be reflective and the space in between will be reflective. Um, now they also, so this is linear and uh, on that confounded laser cutter that is giving me such issues, it has these. So that it can tell where, uh, where along its prismatic joints it's are. It is. <coughs> now they also have versions that are absolute, and um, I can't draw it with a marker, but that's kind of white, and this is kind of sparse, and then we're getting thicker and thicker and thicker, and pretty soon we're all dark. Okay, so that would be like a gradient, and so if we were to look at the reflected light off of this, this would give us an analog value with X, we would have... Um, voltage probably going down because this wouldn't reflect but the white would no flex wood. This this isn't this is a nice smooth gradient not made with a with a sharpie. So this would be absolute. And you could also do the same thing with grayscale encoding, but um, I've I've seen both of these. 
um, and this would be uh, incremental. Now let me give you one last one. Remember the potentiometer I showed you guys? How might I turn that into a linear sensor? Uh, let me let me let me rephrase this. Um, I showed you two potentiometers. One actually was a linear potentiometer, and the other was just a knob. How would I turn that knob one into a linear sensor? Any ideas? Physically. Or digital? Physically. Cable? Cables. How how would that work? Okay, so I've got a knob, and then you're proposing that I take a cable and wrap it around the knob. Okay, like this. Not on the knob at all. Where's where's the end? So one end comes out here. But like basically the ends of the cable are the ends of your bar. Uh-huh. And it's sort of like rotate and then put it up. So you're like 90% there and I'll finish it for you. Which is you take it you take the knob that is the potentiometer and you take a string and you wrap it around and when you yank this rotates. Okay? So if this is S and then this is theta, then we have S is R theta, right? That's what this is. This is called a string pot or a string potentiometer. There are like a billion names for this. If you need to buy one, let me know. I've got a file somewhere I couldn't locate that's got like 20 different terms for it. Uh, what happens is I take this string and see that knob on the back? That's the potentiometer. So as Shruti said, exactly, we're just wrapping right around that. Now the thing is, when I let go, it's spring-loaded. Why is it spring-loaded? So it's always in tension. These are awesome. I'm using this as part of my dissertation. They're pretty expensive, but they're also pretty awesome. NASA likes these. And we're going to talk about these in the spring ones. This is roughly a constant force, so that if you do have it on something, you're not, at least there's a force, but at least it's constant, so you can offset. What's up? Um, the, so a terminal is on your knob, one of the cable terminals? It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. as, as long as there's enough friction on here, I would actually, I believe the way that they're doing it, is um, I believe they're terminating on the knob, and then there's a spring. These things are actually pretty uh, complicated, and I'll show you a breakaway or cutaway view neck, either next lecture or the lecture after. Use what's called a constant, either a uh, spirator or a negator or a constant force spring. They're pretty complicated, but for all intents and purposes, consider this is always spring loaded to pull on the string for tension. You pull this. It, and we're converting linear to rotary version on a potentiometer. What type of encoder is this? Is it incremental? It's absolute because that potentiometer has a unique voltage for every uh, linear distance. All right. One last thing about encoders before we move a little bit. And I will have to find this. So, remember that encoder I showed you that had a shaft coming out of it? Anyone remember this? Someone? Maybe? No? I can hear you breathing. I know you're alive. <laughs> so, um, encoders don't have to only have a hole and accept a shaft. They can also have a shaft of their own. The problem is that sometimes these shafts look like, hey, maybe I can yank on them hard like a motor, and I assure you the answer is no. Encoders with shafts typically are never meant to have um, any real loads applied to them. So uh, this is the gimbal on my spherical haptic device. And um, this is the encoder here. This is another encoder. This is the aluminum aluminum friction differential. And then you see these are the encoder shafts here. Now they're coated in silicone to give something uh, more grippy and more compliant. Um, so the way this is working is this is the differential plate which is pressed against these two aluminum differential wheels. And then those little wheels have a friction drive to the little encoders here. So someone tell me why 
Wouldn't it be simpler if I had just mounted these wheels directly on the encoder shafts? Like, let's draw this for a sec. Um, here I have, this is my differential plate, and then I have two rounded wheels, and then I have a differential block here, and then shafts coming out, and I have a little tightening screw here. So I have these two shafts, and then as drawn right now, I have a little encoder right here, and a little encoder here, and these are driven by friction. So, but this seems kind of weird, right? Because I have shafts here. Why don't I just take the encoders and put it so that I have an encoder, and off of that shaft, I put the wheel. Like this. So this would be simpler and have fewer parts. So why wouldn't I do this? It's way too much load. It's just not going to happen. Never, ever, ever use encoder shafts as a structural element. They're not meant to do that. Now they probably have load specifications on them so that if you're reading and you should be reading all of your technical data sheets, you'll see that. But it would be very tempting to do this and it's just not going to happen. Okay, so let's scrap that. Yeah, that's what I was about to do. So now let's take the little encoder shaft and let's put a little helical coupler here. I showed you last lecture. Okay, so cool. I still only have, you know, now I have two shafts. What is the difference that I get from this configuration as opposed to this configuration? This is a package. Assume for the sec, I don't, I don't care about the aspect ratio. How about performance wise? Some lag. Some lag. Uh, I have a good coupler. Doesn't matter. Anything else? Huh? More rotation. More rotation. I have a gear ratio here. I have big to little. This turns 360, this turns 10 times 360, or whatever it was, 15. I get high resolution, whereas here this turns 360 and this turns what? 360. So by placing it here, the encoder here, I get whatever this gear ratio is, I get the increased resolution um, in terms of sensing that angle. Now, this material here is aluminum. And this material here is steel. It's just a steel shaft on an encoder. And I just told you encoder shafts are very weak, right? So what can I do? If this is a friction drive, it means I have to press the two together. What can I do to make sure this doesn't, you know, break my encoder? Perhaps I could coat this with something a little, a little uh, springier. So what I did is I took silicone, just silicone tubing, and I press fit it on there. And now, you know, because the silicone is, is much more elastic, I can set a lower spring force than if I was trying to set that same a normal force between the, um, the aluminum and the steel. And also, because the silicone has higher friction when used with the aluminum, it means that um, I actually don't have to ha have as high of a normal force. So, uh huh? There's no risk that it slips here? <coughs> Very low loads. If there was a risk, you can, you know, epoxy it in place, but I, in weeks of operation, I never saw it slip. It shouldn't be slipping. It's, it's very low forces involved, just enough to keep it turning. These encoders are low friction. So just to recap, encoders are not structural elements. Never use them as such, even if there's a shaft that looks well supported, I guarantee you it's not. So then, these are structural shafts and the encoder either has to go below or on the shaft. We use a flexible coupler here, but we have a one-to-one -one ratio, which doesn't get us anything. If we place it here, then not only do we have a nicer aspect ratio, but uh, we get um, a much larger increase in resolution from that gear ratio between the, the friction wheel and the encoder shaft. But you do need something like silicone to control the loads on the encoder shaft. Okay, Did, are there any questions about that? 
the way that works. Mm -hmm. Won't the silicon coating over, like, wear out over time? Uh, it shouldn't. They're very, very low um, forces. Remember, there's a difference between using a friction drive to transmit forces for actuating something in terms of like transmitting power and, and the very low forces needed just to transmit motion. So if you were trying to do this, um, say to drive a robot wrist, then this would be the worst way possible to do it because the silicone would slip and it would wear and that would just be terrible. But there's a big difference between transmitting power and transmitting just a tiny bit of motion. Any other questions? Is everyone confident on the way this works? Okay, so that sine wave encoder. Yep. I actually have one last question. Yep. Um, do you actually have something that's tightening the loop of the uh, encoder up against the uh, wheel? Uh, yes. How do you think I should do that? Um, sort of, I guess the same way we're doing with the iPhone. Just a slot. It's a slot with bolt holes. So basically what I did is I took a Sharpie marker and put a dot on the encoder, uh, on the silicone, and then I started spinning the differential wheel. I kept spinning it as I pressed the, as I slid the encoder up, and once I was no longer slipping at all, I tightened it down. I wanted just enough of an interface that I wasn't slipping, and then that's it. I didn't want any higher loads. And it's worked for, I don't know, years now, and, and no problems. Did you pull, you pull directly to the yeah, the encoder had bolt holes in it. So if we looked at this encoder head on, then we had the shaft and then we had two bolt holes. Uh, shafted encoders typically have some means of gripping them and typically it's, shaft, it's uh, screw holes. Okay, so that sine wave encoder, <coughs> again we have A and B. Um, now I'm pretty bad at drawing these things. I'm not even going to draw the... Uh, so, um, remember at the end of last lecture we were talking about types of signals that we wanted to read? Can the group of you read back to me what those types were? Digital in, DI. Digital out, DO. Analog in, analog out. PWM, I'm going to write parentheses it, um, out. What else? Counter. Okay. So, again, this is the whole chicken and egg thing. We're bouncing around a bit for the next couple of lectures because that's what's required. Computers don't inherently have a means of reading this. Please don't solder directly to your serial lines. That's bad. Um, Typically, you'll buy some type of board to do this, whether it be Ethernet, USB, Firewire, PCI, PCIe. Um, and just to give you the, the real quick, the digital stuff is basically free. In terms of boards, that's a no-brainer. That's really easy. The analog in is sort of medium. It's not too expensive or hard. The analog out, for whatever reasons, tends to be hard slash expensive, just in terms of when you buy it, it costs you more money. <clears throat> PWM out is medium, and the counter is medium to hard. You could think about these as mild, medium, and spicy salsa. Um, so sort of the, the levels that we go at I don't know. If you can figure that out and tell National Instruments, I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> so I'm, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to show you a few examples in terms of what these things look like. And then, um, A, it's just useful for you to know physically what do these things look like. And then B, we're going to talk about signals, and that will then tell us about the sign encoder and then how to control our motor. Okay? So, 
If you're a researcher and you need to get your robot running and you need it to work and you don't particularly know what you're doing ahead of time, but you know you're going to need some of all of that, you want a DAC card. That's DAC, D-A-Q. Data what? Acquisition. Does it have a C? Anyone know? Note I'm not lecturing on spelling at Stanford. Ac data acquisition. Um, so they take the A and the Q. And um, these are typically made, the people I've seen who've done it, uh, if you work for like a medical robot company, you'll make your own, which is terrible, because that, well, who wants to make their own DAC card? But they do that so that they meet certain FDA specs in terms of their single point failure tolerance. So if one transistor blows, the robot doesn't skewer anyone. But for researchers like us at Stanford who are happy to skewer people, um, you want to buy a DAC card. And there are two main brands, that being National Instruments and Sensoray. So this goes in your PCI slot, not your PCIe slot. Okay? So this is a. This is a PCI 6602. Now see how it's got kind of a funky uh, ribbon terminal off of that? Okay. Just to show you kind of size relative to my hand. This is a big board. And so what this does is it gives you eight counters. This is a Sensoray something. Rob, what Sensoray board do you use? 626. This is a Sensoray 626. <laughs> Um, so it's about the same size, and Sensoray is a lot cheaper, but I've heard that there might be some performance issues. Let me jump to the, to the, um, the money and just tell you how it is. National Instruments is super reliable. They don't support Linux at all. Don't try. I've been doing it for three years. It's one of these things where you get your code working with the drivers. Uh, I had to use OpenSUSE version 11.0. Now for you, for you elite li uh, Linux hacksaws, you'll know not using Ubuntu makes life terrible. <laughs> now using not the latest version of Ubuntu makes life even more terrible. Now using OpenSUSE, have any of you heard of OpenSUSE? A few of you? Using something that was supported five years ago in OpenSUSE means that every time you install anything, the entire OS breaks. And I've spent weeks at a time reinstalling this. National Instruments refuses to support Linux because no one uses it. That's what they've told me. There's good support from Tomity if you have to use the National Instruments We can get back to that. I've been down that rabbit hole, and at the end there are a pile of rabbit carcasses. <laughs> Sensoray does support Linux. So if you need Linux, you need Sensoray. If you're using Windows, you can use either of them. Um, actually, the, the National Instruments interface for Windows is phenomenal. The only issue is you're coding Windows, and we're going to talk about that another time. So, yeah, they have nicer, nicer stuff. The question is money. And you told me yesterday about Sensoray having Ethernet. Um, they require a lot of money, and you need to keep in mind uh, what your computer has. So for instance, I the reason I'm mentioning this is typically when you're a PhD student, you go into the lab and like, okay, here's the box of stuff. Try not to you know, buy anything that's not already in here. And so you're like, all right, cool. So I've got a 1980s era National Instruments card and it's on PCI. Well, I don't have, they don't really make PCI slots and motherboards very commonly anymore. You have to, so you don't buy one, you know, you don't get a Dell XPS and install it. So then you go to Newegg and you pick when I, the la I did this three years ago and there were two motherboards that supported the number of PCI cards I needed for my DAC cards. Out of all of Newegg's offerings there were two motherboards and one of them was totally terrible. So basically I had one option. Cool. So now you upgrade to National Instruments PCIe and I think they're like twice as expensive as the PCI ones were. And then if you want to get real crazy, you can do Ethernet. Um, but just to let you know, from a research perspective, you want a DAT card. If you're doing Windows, you probably want National Instruments. If you're doing Linux, you probably want Sensoray. And good luck trying to find a motherboard. It'll be either PCIe, in which case you're lucky, or PCI, in which case you're going to be going to Grandpa's house to find his old computer. OK, so let's scratch it down for a sec. Now we're not doing PhD research. Now we're doing like a really cool course project. 
or our advisor is cheap. Ken is not. Ken buys me the best stuff. But um, this is a USB National Instruments DAC card. That I wouldn't even really call it. This is like a DAC POC. It's the latest of POC technology. So this is pretty small compared to these, right? And I got two different brands here. Uh, and they, they have, you know, a very small fraction of the things that um, the DAC cards have. And one of the main limitations is going to be like the resolution in terms of what you get, like how many bits are your numbers, and um, what's the refresh rate. As soon as you start going over USB, you're going to have uh, speed issues, and you're also going to have um, lag issues. And we'll, we'll get back to that another time. Okay, so now you're a high school student, and you're a really good one, and um, I guess all of you were at some point really good high school students. So you're probably familiar with these. This is um, a little Atmega chip with a breakout board, and it's so elite that you actually hand solder on the pins. See how elite that is? The more soldering, the more elite. <laughs> and uh, this costs 20 bucks, and actually it's damned good for 20 bucks. It's got on this little chip, this is a baby orangutan from Palulu, and it's got um, two motor drivers at 8 bit AO resolution. It's got like seven 10 bit analog ins. It's got uh, the capacity to do, I think, two quadrature encoders, and it's compared to my hand, it's tiny. So I'm actually using one of these in my dissertation robot just because it's in a space where I just don't have room for anything else. What's up? So Arduino is a very popular micro, and it's based on the Atmega chip series, and there are very many flavors. Some of my friends just literally buy the chip, the micro, and make their own PCBs. Or you can go to like Palulu or SparkFun and order prefabbed ones that have the pins pulled out and they have motor drivers built in. And so, and uh-huh. When you say motor drivers, you just mean PWI on the side. Oh, no, no. I mean they have H bridges on it. How many amps? One. So, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the C, this is the whole. This C, I mentioned one thing, and someone asked a question, and we skip around. This is, this is good. But um, so let's talk about about signals on DAC cards. They are low current. They are low power. Depending on which one you get, it'll be anywhere from 20 to 50 milliamps. Milliamps. That's hardly enough to turn on an LED. Depending on the LED. I have ones that take like four amps pulsed. <laughs> um, so you're not going to take a digital line out or an analog out, a line out from these and drive anything. You shouldn't even really be doing it for LEDs safely. So then you get these. These are motor drivers. Um, and on, in the case of the little micro, they have really tiny, tiny, terrible versions of these on the board. And so, um, one of these per motor. So the way this works is, so this is uh, analog out of some type, and later we'll talk about PWM. It could be either, depending on the board. And this is gonna be 20 to 50 milliamps and then we're going to do a motor amp or amplifier and then we actually do our motor and now this can be these ones here are uh, up to 20 amps they're big honking amps and you can get them up to 50 if you're doing robot wars don't make these there's no reason. Now, okay, let me, let, me, let me undigest my foot. For those of you in 218, building these lets you know how they work. And knowing how they work teaches you why they're not working when you buy them. So it's good for all of you to have built an H bridge, or for those of you who took the now non-existent 206, to have built a current drive for a motor, just so you can know it's painful to do it, and in the future, you should probably buy them, and when they break, you understand why they broke. But they're self-contained, they're industrial grade, they have all types of certification standards met, just buy them. This is about 300 a pop, and this is called a Copley, and um,
These are really high in amps. They're about 300 bucks a pop. And they are current control. And in a second, that'll bring us to our next, our next topic. I really hate that thing. Uh huh. PWM? Yes. Should I know that? Um, you should, and I will mention that to you in just a sec. Now, that board sticks directly into your computer, right? So how are you going to get it out of your computer? Some type of connector. One of the common mistakes that people make is they say, okay, well, I'm going to buy a DAT card. I'm going to splurge. And they order that, and they stick in their computer, and they're like, well, shit. I have no way of getting into that. So you buy a connector. This is a $300 connector because it is extremely nice. It's got a lot of signals. It's very nicely shielded. Um, and please don't cut these. I've seen Rich Labs cut these in half and then make their own breakout boards, and it, it literally destroys it. Like, There's no reason to use this connector. You could have just soldered to your board, basically, if you cut it. And then this connects to this. This is called a breakout board. Now this is a giant metal shielded box and it's very hard to open. Okay. So it's, it's giant metal and shielded because I could um, have like the RF apocalypse next to it and it wouldn't matter. It's really well shielded. And so I have little screw terminals and I put um, I, I connect all my wires to it, and I'll zoom in here for you. And something else really nice, see that? So you, you clamp them in, clamp your wires in here to stress relieve them. And then each little screw terminal has a number, see, 44, 11, 45, 43. So you look up in your data sheet and you say, I need analog out, and I want the first one. And it tells you, okay, you need pin 11, sweet. Okay, now up here, see that fuse? That fuse keeps your board from frying itself. When it blows, you say, okay, I did something naughty. You go and debug it, then you replace the fuse, but nothing broke. This is a sign of high-end equipment. It's intended for you to screw it up without, you know, having catastrophic failure. So then once you're all pinned in, you close the box, and you can have your apocalypse, and nothing bad will happen. But in terms of quotations, why it's important for, like, why am I telling you this? is uh, in you, you don't need just the board. You need the board, then you need the cable, then you need the breakout board. If you screw up any of those three elements, it will not work. If you have a nice breakout board with a homebrew cable, it won't work. If you have a really nice cable and a homebrew breakout board, again, it won't work. If you decide you're going to use the one foot long, and if you think this is funny, come down to my lab and I'll show you an example. Since array, uh, for some reason sells like one foot long breakout cables, connector cables. They are good just to get beyond the computer case and that's it. This is not helpful. Then I can't reassemble my computer. I can't tie anything down. So I perpetually have this like half open computer that's getting dust and crap inside it. So these details while boring are extremely important. Okay, so types of boards. Typically when you buy a DAC card, um, it's broken up into terms of functionality. Most of your uh, multi-purpose DAC cards will have a little bit of everything. It'll have a bunch of DIDO because they're just really cheap. It'll have, um, you know, maybe eight analog ins, a few PWMs, two counters usually max, um, and if at all, maybe one or two AOs. So what I do, what I have done is, now Sensory is different. Sensory has a lot more channels for the board and for the money, but I've never used them. I always use National Instruments, so I'm telling you just about National Instruments. Um, I get a board that does nothing but count. It is a counter. So the, the PCI 6602 is where I hook up every encoder that I have. And it can handle eight encoders. So this is PCI 6602, eight encoders, that's quadrature encoders. So what happens is, you want to know where your encoder is, so you ask your board, hey, what's your current count, and it tells you. It is always counting up or down, that's all it does, it's its entire job in life. If you weren't using this, if you were going on the cheap and using one of the Arduinos, you'd be doing what's called interrupts, 
where it would be breaking you out of the code you were running, the useful code, and counting. So this is a problem because if you have high speed signals, and a lots of them, then you're constantly interrupting what you're doing. So it, it's, it's like you're a robot and you're trying to get my arm from A to B, and the whole time the, you know, the encoder is saying, hey, hey, we're almost here, we're almost here, we're almost here, and you're distracted. <laughs> with, the, with a counter board on the DAT card, you ask it, you pull whenever you want, and it gives you the, up, the, the current tick. Okay. Now, then I typically have. Um, Could you use like multiple Arduinos? Like just use one Arduino to do the content? Sure. How well does that work? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, there are pros and cons to all of this. I mean, nothing I'm saying here is hard and fast. You can come up with something to disprove everything I've said. I mean, it's a standard deviation. We can get really far from the mean. But um, uh, this is just my average experience. Mm hmm. No, LabVIEW <laughs> is in a bomb in nation. <laughs> it is the worst thing to ever happen to robotics. <laughs> LabVIEW. <laughs> LabVIEW is for engineers who don't know how to code. So it's, it's, a, it's a graphical interface. So if you have like an if statement, rather than typing if, you take a little block labeled if, and then you label an input and an output. And so, um, has anyone ever done Lego Mindstorms? You know how it, uh, you start out with the graphical interface? So I got, I didn't know how to code at all the senior year of high school, and my parents got me Lego Mindstorms for Christmas. And within like four hours, I had a little robot built that would stay within a dark circle with their graphical interface. And then I said, well, this sucks. I can't get it to do anything else because it was a rat's nest and it wouldn't do anything. So then I bricked it and I got, um, Brown has, uh, it's called uh, Not Quite C. It's a subset of C, it's amazing. And then after another hour, I was having it do real things. The issue is LabVIEW is trying to make it user friendly and instead it means no one can use it. It brings everyone, the experience and the experience, down to the same level of lack of productivity. So like the first time I closed a loop at Stanford for research, we used LabVIEW and we just had two closed uh, feedback loops and we could not debug it. Like we just junked the code because we couldn't, we couldn't debug it. Um, so yeah, na that's National Instruments' claim to fame, and it's terrible. It's, uh, brings back bad memories of Lockheed Martin. That's what they use, by the way. <laughs> so uh, all of these DAT cards have a library for C and or C++. So you just plug them in. And actually, for, um, for my year of experimental robotics, I built a robot, and I used the National Instruments boards. And I actually loaded the libraries into MATLAB. So they're very versatile. You can program in MATLAB if you want. You can program in C++ and C. They're great. Okay, so a counter board is often separate because you just need a dedicated board for that. So the rest is called multi-purpose or you can get special purpose. Multi-purpose is a smattering. Special purpose will have like a crap load of AO or a crap load of AI, and that's basically all it does. And so what I've done, uh, I have, wow, I guess the first version of my robot had eight motors with encoders. So I needed eight analog outs, and I had a whole bunch of analog ins and eight counters. So I just bought one of each. I had an, a, uh, an analog in card, an analog out card, a counter card, and then all of them have like 50 digital ins and outs each. So with three cards, you can build anything you want, ever. And the, I don't know what the delay is, but it's minimal in terms of lag between the signal and you seeing the digital representation. Um, they're the best, cleanest, most versatile way of controlling robots for one-off robotic prototypes in a lab. Mm -hmm. How do you interface, interface between them? them? Like if you have multiple cards? Uh, they take care of all the wizardry themselves. Okay, so. Now that we've discussed what these signals are, and by the way, this single-ended and differential thing, 
This is important because on your DAT card, when you have a voltage, whether it be analog, uh, for analog in, you have to tell the DAT card, is it single-ended or differential? You can select it. So this is good because if you have sensors that are prone to noise, then you make it differential, you tell your DAT card it's differential, and it takes care of all of that automatically. But that's a, if your sensor's not working and it's analog and it's a DAT card, chances are you screwed that up. Yep? So if it is grounded and you do differential, wouldn't it still just work the same? Not necessarily. Uh, they're really finicky, and I don't begin to fool myself to think I understand how their electrical stuff works. But having, having reversed these two, I can tell you they don't work. You have to hook them up exactly as it is coded for, for that, and, and then it'll work. Mm -hmm. uh, these backwards, do you draw power directly from your computer? Uh, no. Uh, well, um, no, they're just signal level. So we're going back to this up here. You know, they'll, they'll draw a very minimal amount of power from the motherboard to give you your, your 20 or 50 milliamps per pin. And then after that, you get all the real juice from your motor amplifier. And the motor amplifier has its own power supply right here. Um, and again, that fuse is to protect not only the DAC card but the computer. Because if, if it short circuits in the board and it's connected to your, your motherboard, you'll fry your motherboard too. So, uh, okay. Now that we've discussed basically how you're getting signals in and out of your computer. <sighs> so annoying. Let's talk about that sine wave encoder again. For the quadrature encoder, just the, the 0 to 5, what type of board do you think I'd need? Uh, let me put it this way. I could read this as digital, right? Would I ask what the count is, or would I have to keep count myself in my program if it was digital? Anybody? You can ask. No. If it's digital, if I hook this into a digital in, then I'm responsible as the programmer to keep count. I have to say, hey, are you high? Are you high? Are you high? And then once it says yes, then I add one. And then I say, hey, are you low? Are you low? Are you low? And then I do that. You just like hook it up to the computer or something? That's a different board. And that's a different signal. Digital in and digital out are completely separate from counters. All counters do is count square waveforms like this. That's all they do. If you were to apply a 5 to the counter, it would say, meh. It's looking for a square wave. So if you hook this up to a digital input, then you in your loop have to keep asking repeatedly, are you high, are you low, and then you keep track. That's what you're doing in the microprocessor with the interrupt. So why would you hook it up with the interrupt? Why wouldn't you just hook it up? You wouldn't, but someone suggested it. Oh, I see. But I'm glad someone suggested it because if other people think that's going to happen, that's what's happening on a microprocessor level. On a microprocessor, you have an interrupt, and when it, there's an edge change from this low to high, the microprocessor goes into a special interrupt routine and says, what do you want me to do? And you say, I want you to add one. But it took time out from your servo loop to do that. You never want to screw with the rest of your code. You would like for this to be counting without you doing it. It would be like having, um, I'm not going to go there. Anyway, so. You hook it up to the counter, yes. For the very low level activities, you, you want to black box it. You don't want to be dealing with them. So um, you hook this up to the counter, and the counter does all of this. So all you say is, where are you currently? What's the count? And it just gives you back X counts, and you're done. OK. How about this signal? What type of signal is this and board would I need? This is analog in. OK. So. Will I just ask this, where are you? Or will I have to keep looking at what the voltage is? Does this operate the same way as a counter or not? No, it does not. This suffers from the same problem as hooking a, a, a square wave up to a digital in, which is you constantly have to be looking at where we are. Because all of these look identical, right? Like how do I know that I'm at this point on this 
uh, count and not the same point on a different count. So there are two ways around this, or three. Either you can keep interrupting and looking at the analog voltage, which is going to pwn your program, so that's not really an option. Or you can do something crazy, which is if you feed this into a counter and the voltages, the voltages get down to low and high, it will count. Basically, when it hits the Schmidt trigger le level, it will register high and it will register low. It will be imprecise within that count, but it will sort of work. You could also do it, you could build your own Schmidt trigger comparator circuit and then still hook the analog into your analog board. But, yes? Oh, I was just going to say, do the uh, counters have enough hysteresis that if there's noise on the line, it's not going to count twice for a cycle? They're pretty immune to noise. Um, the... Uh, the problem is when you ask what your count is, you also have to say, what's my analog state? And then, so when I asked the counter, say I hooked this into a counter in a bastardized version, and it said, you're in this count, not this one. Okay, cool. And now I say, where am I at this time? And I say, right there, cool. Now that took time for me to do that. It was a separate call, and it's not particularly precise because I don't know, you know, how well this is converting to a square wave for the counter. They sell interpolation boards for this which look, they keep track of the sine wave counts and also give you within one individual count where you are in that count. They're super expensive and um, I've never seen one. I personally have taken the sine wave and converted to a square wave because I had some really nice secondhand equipment and I, had no, I didn't have an interpolation board so I just converted it to, quadru to a square wave and it sucked. It sucked to build the circuit and I don't recommend it. So what I recommend is know what a, sign, what a sine wave encoder is and don't use them. Just use uh, standard optical encoders with square waves. If you need higher resolution, gear it somehow or get a higher count CPR. Again, Rob has 50 to 80,000 count CPR laser encoders. That's a lot of counts. Okay, so we're completely done with encoders. We've also talked about DAC cards. Um, let's talk just a tiny bit more about the DAC cards though. The PCI and PCIe DAC cards are, are great in that the drivers, if you're not in Linux for National Instruments, work really great and they have a library and you Google an error message and like a billion people have used it and they tell you what it is. If you do something cheaper like the microcontroller, that's perfectly fine. The way I think about microcontrollers with respect to computers is you don't want to close the loop on the microcontroller. I like to view as if you're not doing mobile robotics, then it's fine to hook up your microcontroller to your computer. Basically, a microcontroller to me, for my research purposes, is a little DAC card that I can program. It's almost like an FPGA, but not quite. So what I do is I take the serial line on the microcontroller and I establish two-way communication with my computer and I'm constantly feeding back variables. So for my dissertation I've got this little needle driver and I just don't have room for that much computation there and there are a lot of analog signals and I can't route through 12 feet of cabling to get back to my computer. So basically I've got a little mobile DAC card right there on my needle driver. It reads analog voltages, it takes encoders and sends it back digitally. So let's let's think about this for a sec. Uh huh. Uh, FPGAs, you can literally do anything. I mean, it's like a blank check. You write what type of DAC card you want, and if you really want to know, you should ask Morgan Quigley in Andrew Ing's lab. He programs them every day of the week, and he's amazing at them. And the things he's done with them just blow my mind. Like, you can literally do anything. It's a blank slate. That's the purpose. So let's say I have a potentiometer here and I've got some weird analog voltage. Okay. And then I want to hook this up to my computer over here. And let's say the distance between these two is 12 feet. That's a giant antenna. You're going to get noise on your line and your analog signal is going to be corrupted. Anyone know what type of voltages are on USBs? Hmm? Anything else? They're differential. USBs are all differential uh, voltages. 
So let's make this a USB. Okay, so now because of that we just got rid of a lot of our noise. So what I do here is I put my micro. Here it's analog, here it's digital. I put my microcontroller as close to the analog thing that I'm reading as possible. Convert it to a digital signal, send it down a USB differential line so that I'm protected from noise to my computer. Now what's happening here? Does anyone know how I'm reading a USB signal? Serial. There are these wonderful USB to uh, serial chips. Um, the gold standard is FTDI. Platform independent. Plug it into any computer, it auto installs and you're done. They're beautiful. Uh, so let's see. For Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Some of them. Um, so th there's another issue because some of your microcontrollers don't have a USB plug where you just plug in your USB and comes out. Some, a lot of them, it's just serial. So uh, let's let's draw this. Let's zoom in a little bit here. So we have our analog signal to our micro. That comes out typically as serial. Then we convert to USB. So I'm not going to explain all the serial stuff. Anyone in 218 knows what it is, anyone not, just Wikipedia it. Serial is a communication standard that's old as technology itself. So you'll get a, a really cheap, either you can buy a little serial to USB converter board and they're like the size of your thumbprint, or you can actually get a USB cable that on one end it takes the uh, serial and on the other end it outputs the USB. And you know the, um, do I have a US, uh, yeah, it's right here. This is kind of fun actually. See the fat part of the USB? A lot of these cords have the serial to USB converter in that fat section of rubber. You don't even see it. It's like magic. You have serial lines on one end of the USB and on the other you have a USB signal and it's because that chip is in there. You might notice that that, that rubber is a little bit fatter than typical but... Now let me ask you a question. The serial is not a differential voltage depending on how you do it. It can be. I think it might have a different name then. But coming out of microcontrollers, it's just not differential voltages. So it's much more immune to noise. So what would be better? If there's my analog signal and then there's 12 feet and then there's my computer and at some point I'm going to convert from serial to USB which is differential and the serial is not single-ended. I have an option. I can either put a serial to USB board right here and then have you know 11 feet of USB or I can use one of these special cords that connects the, the serial here and then right as it plugs into the computer it converts to the USB. So which should I do? Converter board because it converts it right here next to the source and then I have a differential noise, pretty noise immune s a signal all the way here. If I use the little cable that waits to convert it until right at the computer, I'm hosed because I basically there's no reason to do it, right? I could have just sent, you know, basically an analog line. Shielded helps, but shielded is not an answer for all things. What you want is you want a differential signal and you want shielded and you want it digitized to the USB differential signal as close to the analog source as possible. Yep? Um, how fast can you get with like USB? Excellent. Um, I know Francois Conti runs his USB uh, at 4 kilohertz for his haptic devices. Now, apparently he has some secret sauce that I do not know. Um, I run mine at, let's see, what was I doing? So some of this is, is conflated together. So as part of my dissertation robot, I have a little microprocessor controlling three different, three, I think four different motors, four or five different motors in closed loop control. So as in I'm sending positions and then it's sending me back encoders and it's also sending me back some sensors for five motors, four motors. And I'm doing that 500 hertz. 
So I'm only using the little microcontroller as a, as a DAC board. It's not doing anything like on the um, on chip, on board. I'm sending uh, I'm sending voltages, and then it's giving those voltages to the motors. Then it's sending me back encoders. I'm closing it in the computer, and then I'm sending back the new voltage. And I'm doing that for four motors at 500 hertz. So to clue you in, for controls. The standard golden number for, uh, for haptics is around a kilohertz, a thousand hertz. Um, if you're Rob, you're doing 10 kilohertz. I have uh, the robot I made, actually I've never showed you, that might be fun. Um, for experiment, it's the secret sauce, get it, get it out of them and, and, and give it to me. He, he co-started a haptics company called Force Dimension, and they, they make like Swiss engineering. It's like Swiss chocolate. It's very exquisite. Uh, his haptic devices are just phenomenal. I mean, um, so this, this, is, this is not um, self-promotion. This is simply because I'm teaching from experience, so I'm showing you what I've done. So uh, a couple years ago, or three years ago, in experimental robotics, come on. Okay. Ball spot. <laughs> so for experimental robotics, I didn't want to use a Puma, so I made my own. And what it did was it wrote in a spherical spiral down the side of a, like those little Chuck E. Cheese balls in the in the ball pen. And so it just had three prismatic degrees of freedom. And then there's a remote center of motion with a marker that was spring-loaded with a magnet. <clears throat> and it, I did feed-forward gravity compensation so it wasn't going to fall over. And then I did some MATLAB stuff where basically you type in a sentence. It generates waypoints in terms of uh, XYZ on the ball. So this one was saying cool robo tattoo. Then it fed those coordinates and waypoints to the robot, and the robot met them. And so this is sped up, but you can see it kind of going around. Okay, so someone tell me, you see the last link with the marker? If I shut down power, do you think that would want to fall over? You said it's magnetic. Right? No, uh, sorry, the, the kind of swing arm. You see how the the feed forward gravity compensation. I need feed forward gravity compensation. It will fall over without it. In terms of systems that might go unstable, this is uh, this is on up there. This is an inverted pendulum. It's not like a brick sitting on the table and I turn off power and it stays there. This is an inverted pendulum that wants to fall over. Tell me how fast I was running my loop at from MATLAB. <laughs> what? Were you running it? Uh, no, no, just plain old MATLAB. Plain old MATLAB. 200. Anywhere from 150 to 200, depending on whether QuickTime was updating. Now, this has better handwriting than I have. I also probably have lifetime toxicity from that Sharpie marker. So the reason I'm showing this to you is because in terms of the canonical, like how you should connect a robot to a computer, this is like one of the worst possible ways you could have done it. Because A, I was in Windows, and I know most of you probably hate Windows for coding at this point. B, it was not a real time system. C, it was only 200 hertz or 150 to 200 hertz for an inverted pendulum. And C, it wasn't even in C or C, it was in MATLAB. I'm showing this as an example of you can do good engineering using 150 to 200 hertz in MATLAB uh, in Windows. So anything above that is gravy. What I don't want to hear is you have to do a real-time kernel of Linux in C++ or else there's no point because that's just not true. And I have this as evidence. And I also have every other single robot I've ever made, which is evidence too. And we'll talk about that another time. Huh? No, no, no. Now I run uh, C++. Uh, but uh, sometimes I do it in Linux, sometimes I do it in, um, in Windows, but it doesn't really matter that much. 
and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, uh, let's just talk about it now. And this is my personal experience. Yes. So when you were talking about encoders, you were worried, you know, you wouldn't want to do interrupt-based programming because that takes time out of the processor. However, you have no qualms with closing the loop through a computer. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. I mean, it, it seems that if you were to close the loop closer, you know, in that microprocessor itself, that would, you know, you could increase. The problem is most of these microprocessors are 8-bit, the cheap ones. And so you're not going to do much math in it. You don't even have libraries with some of them for doing math. So you're like a lookup table for sign. And so if you're doing good math and you're doing matrices and you're doing feed forward compensation and dynamic compensation, you're not going to do that on an 8-bit micro. Um, there, if you're going to do micros where you're closing loops locally, you want to do what Morgan Quigley is doing, which is where he has 32-bit super freaking fast micros there. Um, that can do lots of computation and, and they're built for doing math. It's like basically a cell phone in your robot. I use cheap 8-bit ones just purely for give me my digital ins, outs, analog ins and outs. But yes, there is some inconsistency. Hopefully we'll get towards, hopefully we'll, we'll get rid of that. Uh, so, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Mac does not really support hardware. I've never seen a single person do robots in Macs. If that person is you, I apologize. So pretty much I've only ever seen Windows, and that's a driver thing. Um, I've only really seen people do Windows in Linux. So uh, anyone know what the scheduler is? So the scheduler is what in your OS says, when are we going to do stuff? So when you click on something, but it's also trying to not burst in flames, you know, it's doing some calculation really quickly, it's going to balance, well, should I do this calculation first? Or should I handle your click, click first? Should I let QuickTime update? Um, should I have your little weather icon bug update? And so the main difference between Windows and Linux is that Windows scheduler is terrible and Linux scheduler is much better. There are other differences too, but this. Th there are th that's the main difference is when you tell something to happen in Windows, it kind of takes its sweet time and then does it at some point. Linux has multiple schedulers and they're much better and you can also do real-time Linux where it's actually hard coded it will fire at this precise time or your computer will crash and that's what Rob does. There are some cases where you're doing such precision uh, science where you have to have real-time Linux or I think it's called RTI and in Rob's and Dan Walker case is absolutely essential. It is not absolutely essential for everything else. I've built many robots here, half of them in Linux, half of them in Windows, some of them at a kilohertz, some at two kilohertz, some at 200 hertz. They've all worked basically about the same. The trick is, if you are in, uh, there are a couple of things. In Linux, the main issue is going to be drivers. I would code all the time in Linux except that none of my hardware is supported. If you can do sensor array, fine, do Linux. If you need national instruments, you can't do Linux. It's just a fact of the drivers. I prefer to code in Linux because they have something called QT Creator, which is phenomenal. Anyone who hasn't used it will by the end of the quarter, probably. So then if you go to Windows where they do have driver support, then you have the scheduler issue where it's taking a sweet time. Has anyone ever tried to read precisely from the clock on a Windows machine? You can't do it. It just doesn't work. In some of the old XPs, they had a bug where it would go off the CPU clock, but it would try to save power and throttle down, but it wouldn't tell the clock that. So it would be running actually at lower clock cycle frequencies, but it didn't assume it, it didn't know about that. So the issue is I want to be in Windows for driver support. I don't have a precise clock from the OS, but I do have this smorgasbord of wonderful counters. Use a counter. So, and this feeds back to the PWM. See, this is all recursive and dogs eating its own tails and pooping out its head, it's terrible. So um, this PWN, I can, I can set basically a square wave output. Don't worry about what PWN stands for, I'll tell you about that in a sec. Say for the sake of argument, I can make a, a, a precise 50% um, duty cycle square wave, just like I've drawn on the board here, and then I can read it on a counter. Now these things are precise. When I tell it 10 kilohertz, it really means business. It's 10 kilohertz. I don't know what the standard deviation is, but it's small. So I output this PWM from hardware, not the computer. 
This is not your computer. You're not, you're not looking, you're not running as fast as you can saying, go high, go low, go high, go low. You tell your board, I want to set up this waveform and it does it. And then you can check your email and this signal is still there. Then I'm reading it on my counter and my counter is reading that clock cycle automatically without me having to ask it. What this means is I have a rock solid clock independent of OS. I could do Linux, I could do Windows, it doesn't matter. Because this is its own clock, it works. And this is what I always do and this is how I've gotten around even in MATLAB timing issues is I output a precise PWM, I read in a precise PWM and I get my clock. It eats a counter but it's worth it because then you can work on Windows with a bad scheduler and everything's time stamped. Let's talk about one last thing. Servo rate. Anyone know what, uh, servo loop. Anyone know what that is? So in a program where you're controlling a motor, perhaps a servo motor as the name might imply, you're going to be trying to do something. So let's say it's going to theta. So every millisecond I'm going to say, hey, where are you? Okay, now go here. Hey, where are you? Okay, now go here. It's called the servo loop. Don't screw with the servo loop. It needs to be as rock solid as possible. When you're calculating velocities, you need to know what that delta T was between the last loop call and the current loop call. Because you're going to be doing something like theta new minus theta old over delta T. And I'll put a digital filter on there next week. But for now, you're going to be dividing by delta T and you need to know what that delta T is. If you ask Windows, this will explode. Use the PWM to the counter. The other thing is, even if you're on Windows and still after all of this, the scheduler is screwing you over, and instead of this nice square wave, you actually have some oscillation like you saw on my oscope. Because you're measuring delta T precisely here, you each individual servo clock cycle, you can get still a very precise velocity estimate. Don't assume delta T. Don't set your clock, your servo rate at a kilohertz and think, okay, I divide by a millisecond. No, that's dumb. We have a clock, use it. You set it at a kilohertz, hope for the best, but you measure this and if it's, you know, at 0.9 or 1.1, it updates so you're much more accurate. So I say all of this, one second, I say all of this because a good friend of mine, Kurt Salisbury, built a six degree of freedom um, haptic device, m masterwork of mechanical design, and then he ran it on Windows. And some of the people are like, well, hey man, why are you doing that? So what he did was he ran it as fast as he could. He didn't even try for killer. She just said go. It wasn't an even servo loop. It ran as fast as it could. Sometimes QuickTime slowed it down, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes checking his email slowed it down, sometimes it didn't. He measured, but, he read from the PWM, PWM to the counter, he read it each time, each loop cycle, he knew precisely what delta T was, so he still had a very good estimate of what the velocity really was. And he was doing sixed off haptic rendering at around four kilohertz. Just Windows computer, XP, email in the background, as fast as it can, and it, it was stable and beautiful and worked great, even on Windows, even with email open. I'm saying this all to you now because much as worm gears aren't inherently bad, Windows isn't inherently bad. Now I hate Windows. I do and I hate coding in it. But if, if sometimes if you have a DAT card in National Instruments, it has to be Windows. And if it's going to be Windows, the reason people whine about it is because they're doing it the wrong way. You can make a bad situation better by being smart, by using your PWM into a counter and then measuring and updating Delta T rather than just assuming it. One last thing. I tell it to go at a kilohertz. Does it go at a kilohertz? No, it does not go at a kilohertz. And then some weenie comes and say, hey, I bet your robot is not going at a kilohertz because you're in Windows. Ha ha ha, I'm elite. So how do you disprove this person with something here in this room? The oscilloscope. No one can argue with the oscilloscope. This is what it does. So in your servo loop, every time you enter the servo loop, where basically you're saying, where am I, where should I be, update the voltage and currents, you toggle a digital outline. Okay? If it was five, now it's zero. If it was zero, now it's five. You plot it on your oscilloscope. You use a little measure frequency thing. It will tell you precisely what your servo loop really is and there's no arguing with it. And you can literally check, and Kurt did this as a joke, he showed the oscilloscope, then he pulled up his email and you see it just go like, 
You know, it was really solid, like you took a picture and now it's just all over the place. His haptic device still worked very well, but you could see on the oscilloscope how the servo rate was changing. So I'm saying this because I've had multiple researchers in my lab use Windows, verify it with the oscope. If you're verifying it with the oscope and it's working, you're done. There's no argument. Okay, we're going to go back. We're going to start on motors. Yeah. Yes. All of these boards will have a maximum refresh rate. So you can't just blast this counter with an infinitely fast square wave. It will quit counting. And the board will tell you in the spec sheet what that is. I have personally never seen this be an issue, ever. Even I had some ridiculous, I had a linear encoder that measured point one, uh, what was it? No, one micron resolution. And I was just ripping back and forth in one micron resolution and it, my board still handled it. So Rob may run into these issues because he has like 100,000 CPR before quadrature, but I personally haven't. But read your spec sheet. Okay, let's talk about motors. So now we've talked about how to sense the position on a motor with what? A quadrature optical encoder. We've talked about how to get that, that signal into uh, the computer, but now we're going to talk about how are we actually going to drive a motor. So, let's take this motor. We won't get through all of it today, but we can look at it. Oh, that's a, that's a bad motor. Okay, I'm going to pass some motors out to y'all. And I want you to play with them. Now you will note, they are all labeled dead. I want these motors back, but if I don't get them back, I can always fry another one. <laughs> there you go. Let's do like one per row and then pass them around and just feel them. And you can also look at some of the things I'm describing along the way. Okay. Exhibit A is a motor. Back of the motor, front of the motor. This little cap stand here is, I think that's press fit on by some unwise person. This is a Maxon motor. Okay, see that shaft on the back? It's called the back shaft. This terminal here and this terminal here, those are the terminals that give juice to the motor. They have labeled plus and minus somewhere on here. If you want your motor to spin the right way for a positive voltage, pay attention to the plus tab when you solder it. Let's look at the back. You see some screw holes on there? What are those screw holes for? Attaching the encoder. That's a pretty stubby little shaft. Let me show you a different motor. <clears throat> yep. If you attach the motor, do you have to take that back plate off? No, you cannot take that. Do not take that back plate off. Tell me something obvious about these two motors. Huh? Back shaft the back shaft is much longer on the left one. I will tell you, based on personal experience, you cannot install a US digital encoder on the right, and you can very easily on the left. Now why Maxon does this, I have no clue. But this is a great example of even on high-end motors, it may have a back shaft and it may be too short to attach an encoder. Do not assume because you're getting a high-end Maxon motor that you can put an encoder of your choosing on it. Get the CAD for your motor, CAD up the adapter plate between it and the uh, encoder and put the encoder on and if it's not long enough, get a different motor. The alternative is using an adhesive and I'll slap your hands if I see you doing this. Let's look at the front. What's the name of this shaft? Yeah, front shaft, drive shaft. This is a gearbox right here, by the way. And what are those screw holes for in the front? Okay, cool. Now, those front uh, screw holes are for mounting the motor. What's a different way I could mount this motor? Huh? My hand. Why is my hand any different from a chunk of aluminum? I'm just as strong and good looking. I, I can literally clamp on the outside of this motor and not have to use these bolt holes. 
The two main ways of attaching to a motor are either bolt holes or clamping on the outside. Just make sure that it, you know, it's not going to, if it's a plastic gear head, don't do it, you'll crush it. If it's metal, you're probably just fine. Just don't clamp that hard. Can you clamp anywhere on that gear head or is it just that aluminum hub? Uh, anywhere. If, what I would do is I would take some light sandpaper and make sure that all this lettering doesn't have any type of raised texture so it's smooth. But um, let me ask you another question. This one is also from Kurt Salisbury and a little bit myself. <clears throat> I can hold this motor and spin the shaft and put some pulley on it. What's the other way I could do this? Hold the shaft. I could hold the shaft and spin the motor. I kid you not, there's a robot hand under development that is doing that. And um, the reason you might want to do that is you have to measure it and make sure, I mean, if you buy like a Chinese made motor, it's probably not going to be the case. Some of these Maxon casings are actually ultra high precision. They're just as good as the shaft in some instances. And so what you could do, as long as you're doing limited rotation so that these terminals don't break off, or you could even do a slip ring, you could get a very large diameter shaft directly off, right? You're not, if you have a motor with a shaft, the diameter of this motor, so the, the shaft itself is 20 millimeters, how big do you think is the rest of the motor? Huge. So if you need a little motor with a gigantic fat diameter shaft, perhaps you're holding it in the wrong direction. You should hold the shaft and spin the motor. Now that is a very unusual thing to do. I do not recommend you do it in most cases. If you find yourself doing that, you're getting desperate. You should ask yourself, are there any alternatives to doing this? Some instances, such as in this robot hand, you have to do it. I just want to, you all to know it's possible and to sort of don't think about using things in only one way. Think if there are other ways that you could use it. Uh-huh. Doing it the other way, won't loading be an issue? Won't loading be an issue? Load the body of the <coughs> Um. It doesn't matter. Just make sure you don't have a huge lever arm. We're going to get to that in a sec. Mm -hmm. Can you um, install your own gearbox? I would not recommend it. <clears throat> but you can install your own gearbox. I don't know. I've never done it. I suppose you can, but I mean, were I going to use a Maxon encoder and I wanted a gearbox, I would order an assembly from Maxon that had everything installed, the gearbox, the motor, and the optical encoder. Half of this is from I don't want to deal with it. And half of it is from, if I screw it up, I have to order more parts. If they screw it up, they give it to me for free. You always want other people to be liable for things that you could potentially screw up. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, what type of signal should I send my motor to get it to spin? No, 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 more, more abstract. Is it, a, is it a voltage, a current, a resistance, an inductance? Some of you should be wincing in pain at me suggesting that. No one's wincing. One's harder. Okay, there are two ways. I can drive my motor with a voltage or I can drive it with a current. <coughs> if they're exotic things I don't know about, I apologize. <coughs> One of the main laws of motors is tau, is this constant called kT times I. This is torque on the motor. This is a constant which uh, re relies on a bunch of things including winding geometries and diameters and lengths and material properties, etc. Just get it off the data sheet. This is current. This is for when you want to send forces and torques into the real world. Haptic devices, this is always what you do. So say I have a one degree of, <coughs> a one degree of freedom linear, uh, let's do rotary just because that's, you know, whatever. So I want to apply a torque here and I've calculated mathematically what I want that torque to be. Easy. I send a current and I'm done. The way this works with the Copley amp <coughs> is from your computer <coughs> you send a voltage. Now Copley takes that voltage and figures out what current that should be using something called transconductance. It's a made up word, I think. Okay, and now it outputs a current. 
So basically, because we're not outputting currents from our computer, we're outputting voltages. So we output a voltage, and typically, if it's a digital amp, you'll set, you'll go in in their software and you set, you know, I want, I want 10 volts to go to one amp, or you could have it go to 10 amps, or you could have it go to 0.3 amps. So it knows when I see 10 volts, that that's how much juice to give it. Okay? If it's analog with Copley, you set a little resistor. It's a pain. If it's digital, you just type it in. So then it outputs a current, but what it is, is it's a set point. Motor, and then it measures the current and feeds back. This is, it's not magically outputting a perfect current, it's a feedback loop, okay? So this is your motor, and it's sensing what the real current is, and it's feeding back. So let's go over this again. Haptic device, I want to give a real world torque. I compute it mathematically, easy. I know what current I need to send. I can't send a current, instead I send a voltage. Copley amp takes the voltage, converts it to a set point for current, then does a closed feedback loop around sensing the current in the motor and gives you the actual current in the motor and it spins precisely as you want. This is the easiest and best way to do motor control for high-end robotic applications. Just about nobody does this. As wonderful as haptics is, um, there are a lot of industrial robotic guys who don't even know what the word means and they all do voltage drives where we're not, we're not trying to give a current, we're trying to give a voltage. So let me come over here and draw this out. Okay, so a motor can loosely be drawn as a resistor, an inductor, a back EMF, and then, of course, this is your voltage source. So this is R, this is L, and this is back EMF. Okay? I'm assuming all of you have seen this in collegiate physics. Okay, so this uh, is IR, and then uh, this is L, D, I, D, T, and then this is K, E, theta dot. Okay, right? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, so let's go through these term by term. Motors are made of. I guess I didn't tell you. Do do I need to calibrate how much you guys know? Do you know how a motor is physically constructed? No. Okay. I'm gonna split these pages. Um, I don't know if this is loud or not, but Ed's a really nice guy, so. If Ed's listening, you're awesome, and I'm using your book because you're the best. Okay, this is a DC brush motor. This outside here is called the stator. It's a giant chunk of metal, it doesn't move. This is what we bolt to something or clamp onto. Uh, and inside, there's a, a set of giant permanent magnets that create a magnetic field inside. Can someone flip on the lights, please, actually? See if this gets better. Uh. Yeah, worse. Okay, this is the shaft, and it's connected to these copper uh, spools here. Can everyone see that? Not really. I need to know because otherwise I can draw it on the board. Turn more lights off? Let's try lights off. How's that? <laughs> that's way better. Okay, so look at the inside. See those copper wires? They're free to rotate. Okay, now look at the back. See the commutator? And then see the brushes and the springs? So what happens is the terminals of the motor, you bring current in and it runs through those coils and then because you have electricity inside of a magnetic field that produces a resulting uh, magnetic field, right? So we're going back to Maxwell's equations. We've got current inside of a, a coil, uh, 
a loop of uh, 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 wire, so that produces a magnetic field, but there's already a permanent magnetic field. The magnets war and the motor spins. Now, as each coil gets to a different position, its lever arm is, is changing so that that force doesn't do anything for spinning the motor. That's why we have multiple uh, offset at different angles coils. That commutator there at the back is what brings electricity into the coils. It's kind of like a slip ring. Remember the slip ring? I'm able to get electricity from those brushes into the commutator because it's just friction. There's nothing mechanically between them. So I rotate and that is what fires and times the copper coils to energize at the exact right moment to get maximum leverage arm. Um, and then let me show another thing. See this? That coil represents one loop of, of uh, the motor winding. As shown, that's got a pretty big moment arm. If we turn 90 degrees, it would have a zero moment arm in terms of producing a torque. So that's why we have to do a triangle where we have three or, three or more, actually typically way more than this. You have them set all around at all the various angles so that at any given time we're producing high torque even as the other coils are at a zero lever arm. Now these brushes are really important. That commutator, it's the sliding, that's sliding. These are often graphite or um, precious metals and there's a spring applying a normal force between them so that we have contact to uh, give electricity. What is happening in at that sliding contact that is bad? Sparks. And drills, yes. What, what other than sparks? Don't mumble, I can't hear you. Friction. friction. Okay, friction. In Maxon Motors, the nice ones, they use precious metal brushes. Very low friction. Really crappy ones like the, those in your drill use graphite brushes. Graphite brushes, oh god. Graphite brushes are very high friction and are not suitable for, say, haptics. So one of the things is, if you're doing applications where you need to be able to control low speed precisely, or give low forces precisely, or you need a high dynamic range, so you're going to be doing little forces and big forces, that, that friction between the brushes and the commutator and the DC motor is the minimum force you're going to be able to give, right? Say the friction is 0.2 newtons, and you try to give 0.1 newton. Well, you can't because the motor's not spinning. So that friction is very important. That's why you want to go with Maxons that have precious metal brushes. Okay, so... How I, do you conduct with brushless? Uh, that's a whole other mess of fish. We'll talk about that another time. I just want to get through this real quick. So this is changing current, right? The inductive, the inductive field wants to keep the same current. For all the calculations, when you see these uh, equations, we assume steady state, that's zero, and we just don't worry about it. So we've got IR, this is just Ohm's law, and then this. This is just, uh, there's a law for this. Faraday's law. Faraday's law is that the back EMF, which is a voltage, we'll call that voltage for a motor, is Ke theta dot. That's how fast the motor's spinning, okay? So if this motor weren't spinning, this term would be zero. If this motor's spinning fast, it's a big term. So now what we do is we go around, <coughs> we sum these up, and again, steady state, so the inductance is gone. We get V is IR plus KE, and they usually call this omega, although I hate that because the theta dot lets me know it's a time derivative. And then I can plug in, remember the equation I wrote over there, which is tau equals kti for the torque. If I plug all of this together and rearrange, and I'm not doing that, feel free to Wikipedia or look for Ed's book. I get an equation, omega is V over Ke minus R kt ke tau. Now Ke and kt uh, depending on how you're doing it, they're actually the exact same thing with different units. Don't worry about it. Look them up in the data sheet and you're good as gold. V is whatever voltage we're driving at. Let's say for now that's 12 volts. I don't care. Resistance is just the, the resistance from all that copper wire inside the motor. So the resistance is due to the fact that we have any wire. The inductance is due to the fact that we have coils of wire. Okay, so what this means is if I graph this, I have a line where this is torque and then this is omega, okay? 
And this is for one voltage, say 12 volts. So let's hold that constant. And you can see that omega is linear with torque, right? So now I can draw other lines. They're supposed to have the same slope. So maybe this is 6 volts and then this is 24 volts. Now let's talk about, about some important parts in this line. You can't get off this line. When you spin a motor and you apply a torque, at least for DC, in steady state, please don't argue with me about transients, you're stuck on this line. If you grip the motor and don't let it spin, you're right here. Okay? That's where omega is zero, it's not spinning, and it's called stalled. That's stall torque. What is the, uh, with stall torque, this term goes to zero and it's just V equals IR. So then I is V over R. That's the max current you'll ever get. Now let's not grab it, let's let go. We're going to have the motor spinning, we're not touching it, no loads. We come up here. Your motor will never spin faster than that, ever. That's called omega NL for no load. As you apply pr more and more torque to that shaft to slow it down, you travel backwards this way. Maybe I reverse that. You back it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So it's spinning fast, and then you start applying pressure with your fingers. It's spinning, spinning, spinning. It stops moving, and we're at uh, stall torque. Okay? Now, there's another time when you see stall torque. When is it? Right when you start up. You're not moving, which means omega is zero. And so as soon as you turn on the motor and start spinning, you get stall torque. This is a problem because people think, okay, well, I'm going to... I know at stall torque for my motor, I need two amps of current. Great. I'll make sure I never apply loads that give two amps of current. I'll only ever do 1.5 amps. Terrific. Well, then they start up their motor and they're like, well, shit, how am I getting this current? Where is this coming from? It's because every time your motor stops spinning and you turn it back on, omega is zero, so we're at stall torque. So keep that in mind. Uh, we started three minutes late, so I'm going to keep you three minutes late, but if you really need to go, you can, you can run. Now, remember before I said that basically we were sending current commands for the whole tau equals KTI and haptic devices? Here we're doing something different, and I'm going to erase these other lines because they're a little confusing. Okay. <clears throat> In steady state, Assume that we leave tau the same. Either, I don't know, grip it with one newton meter or don't grip it at all and we're at no load. If we increase the, vo the voltage, what happens? I flubbed it, you should know, I just said it. Okay, this is constant now, I'm not doing anything to it, and I increase that 12 volts to 24 volts, what happens to my omega? It spins faster. What happens if I half the voltage? I half the velocity. That is why if you're doing voltage drives, they'll often call it a velocity drive or a velocity command. It's not necessarily true. This is only for steady state. Remember, the inductance is gone just for these equations. But it is true that if you were to take a motor and apply a voltage without touching it and you increase the voltage, you would have a proportional increase in the uh, revolute speed. So. The two main types of motor drives that you use most of the time, and we're not talking about brushless or any of that stuff. Force control, tau equals KTI, you need a special current source. We're not commanding voltage, we're commanding current. Don't build these, they're unstable, this is bad. 206ers will know this. If you're trying to command position, you can't with a DC brush motor. You command velocity, and then you tie a digital spring around it, to get the position you need. You're not commanding theta, you're commanding theta dot due to this equation. Okay? One last thing. Yep? It completely um, depends. Completely depends. Stepper have, steppers have their own nasties. How do I generate that voltage? I got these boards. How do I uh, generate that voltage? I've got two ways. I can do analog out or I can do PWM. Analog out is a nice crisp signal where I say 5 volts and it gives me 5 volts. PWM 
is an approximation. So say this is 5 volts and this is ground. And I do this. On average, what does this voltage look like? 4.8 or something. Now let's draw another one. Around 0.2. What we do in PWM is we turn off, it's a digital signal, we turn it on and turn it off really quickly. And what we're doing is we're controlling this percentage. Actually, it's, it's the other one, it's the little one. The percentage of time that we're on is called the duty cycle. Okay? If it's 100%, you're at 5 volts. If it's 0, you're at 0. It's a cheap way, especially for microcontrollers, of producing uh, an average voltage somewhere. Okay? And we, uh, so we'll end there and we'll start up with more about motors, but by and large, people use PWM to create voltage for voltage drives which command velocities. We're done!